In the past, humans had long yearned to be able to get off the ground and fly. In the early 20th century, some daring inventors turned this desire into reality by creating flying machines like the helicopter. The helicopter is one of these few machines that gives humans the ability to enjoy air transportation. To fully appreciate the complexity of the flying vehicles, we'll look more into how these machines really work. First up, going to the drawing board. The modern mechanical marvel actually began as a Chinese top that consisted of a bamboo shaft with feathers attached to one end. Yup, you heard that right. When a person put the stick between their hands and spun it quickly, the top would rise vertically into the air. Although it was a pretty simple creation, a few inventors took the Chinese top and gave it an upgrade. In 1754, Russian inventor named Mikhail Lomonosov modeled a small rotor to the design of a Chinese top and then used a wind-up spring to power the device. A helicopter rotor is essentially a rotating part with airfoils or blades. About 30 years later after this addition, a French naturalist, Christian de Lannoy, made a similar rotor by attaching bird feathers to both ends of an axle. A string was then wrapped around the axle and tensioned by a crossbow. This mechanism is what generated the power for the rotor. When the tension was released, the rotating blade lifted the device vertically. These earlier designs were honestly more experimental toys than actual means of transport, but some of the best minds in the history of science and engineering took them and worked hard to make the vertical lift flight a possibility for humans. Leonardo da Vinci also contributed to the development of the helicopter as he drew sketches for several flying machines, including one he dubbed the aerial screw. The screw essentially was made up of a linen wing wrapped around an axis or screw. Thanks to later developers, engines had finally evolved enough to move helicopters from the drawing board to reality. The infamous Thomas Edison, who experimented with some helicopter designs in the early 1900s, showed that high aerodynamic efficiency of the rotor and strong power from an engine was needed in order to achieve successful vertical flight. Next, we have Igor Sikorsky's impact. Although inventors were starting to produce advanced models of vertically flying vehicles, it would be a man named Igor Sikorsky who would come along and change the direction of these flying machines. Sikorsky, a Russian aeronautical engineer, created the first machine with all of the qualities we associate with helicopters today. Surprisingly, Sikorsky's early helicopters, which he made around 1910, had a pretty high failure rate, causing Sikorsky to abandon his efforts in order to better focus on fixed-wing airplanes. In 1931, Sikorsky requested a patent for a modern-looking helicopter design, which had a single main rotor and tail rotor. Around eight years later, the first type of this design, the VS-300, took Sikorsky into the air. The VS-300 had a Lycoming engine that had 75 horsepower. It was attached to the main rotor with three blades and a two-bladed tail rotor. It, too, had mechanisms for controlling the machine's flight. The aircraft the aircraft had two inputs, the collective and cyclic pitch sticks. These inputs enabled a pilot to change the orientation of the blades so a lift would be produced, and lateral movement would be enabled. Sikorsky's machine was considered to be the first practical helicopter, but it still needed some extra touches so the flight wasn't so shaky. Sikorsky continued to work on the vehicle and successfully made improvements, and so by May 1940, the the VS-300 broke the world helicopter endurance record by remaining in the air for 1 hour, 32 minutes, and 26.1 seconds. This breakthrough paved the way for other engineers and innovations to quickly follow suit. Now for the blades and engines. Sikorsky and a few of his peers brought technical rigor to the aviation field that finally made vertical flight safer and more reliable. While the flight-obsessed inventor continued to refine his helicopter designs, he also worked out the essential requirements that this machine needed in order to operate successfully. Some of the requirements included having an engine with a high power-to-weight ratio, a mechanism that would counteract rotor torque action, a lightweight structural frame, proper controls, and a technique to reduce vibrations. Many of the basic parts we see on modern helicopters developed out of the need to address one or more of these basic requirements. Let's look a bit
bit deeper into some of these parts and their functions. For starters, we have the main rotor blade. This part performs the same function like the wings on an airplane do, which is that it provides lift to the vehicle. The stabilizer bar sits right on top of, and across, the main rotor blade. The stabilizer's weight and rotation help to reduce unwanted vibrations in the main rotor, helping to stabilize the craft overall. The rotor mast, also called the rotor shaft, connects the transmission to the rotor assembly. This part helps with rotating the upper swash plate and the blades. Last, but certainly not least, we have the engine. The engine produces power for the aircraft. Many earlier models of helicopters relied on reciprocation gasoline engines, but helicopters today use gas turbine engines, like the ones used in commercial airplanes. Now we have working the controls. Being able to control the aircraft is obviously extremely important for anyone steering the aircraft if they aren't looking to crash the thing. Let's go over some of the parts that help control the aircraft in different ways. A helicopter pilot can manage the angle of the rotor blades with two inputs, the cyclic and collective pitch levers, often just called the cyclic and the collective. The cyclic comes out of the floor of the cockpit and is seated between the pilot's legs. It allows a pilot to tilt the craft to either side or forward and backward. The collective pitch lever is what causes up and down movements. For example, during takeoff, the pilot can use the collective pitch lever to increase the pitch of all the rotor blades by the same amount. A pair of foot pedals control the tail rotor. The pedals affect which way the helicopter points, so pushing the right pedal deflects the tail of the helicopter to the left and the nose to the right, and vice versa. Without a tail rotor, the main rotor would simply spin the fuselage in the opposite direction. Just the thought of all that endless circling is enough to make us feel nauseous. Thankfully, Igor Sikorsky was smart enough to install a tail rotor to counter the torque reaction, which allowed for directional control. So let's discuss the rotor assembly. A helicopter's main rotor is the most crucial part of the vehicle. It provides the lift that allows it to get off the ground, as well as the control that lets it move in different directions, make turns, and change its altitude. To handle all of these tasks, the rotor needs to be incredibly strong. It also needs to be able to adjust the angle of the rotor blades with each revolution made. The pilot can manage these adjustments through a device called the swash plate assembly. The swash plate assembly consists of two parts, the upper and lower swash plates. The upper swash plate is connected to the mast through special linkages. As the engine moves the rotor shaft, it also turns the upper swash plate and the rotor blade system. The rotor blade system includes blade grips, which connect it to a hub. Control rods from the upper swash plate are connected to the point on the blades, allowing for a transfer of movements of the upper swash plate to the blades. Lastly, the hub mounts to the mast through the Jesus nut, which has interestingly been named so because it's said that its failure can bring a pilot face to face with Jesus himself. Finally, up, up, and away. When it comes to helicopters, getting off the ground and into the endless sky is the most important part. Now, imagine that we want to make a machine that can simply fly straight upward. Let's not even worry about getting back down for the moment. Going up to the sky is all that matters. If you're going to provide the upward force with the help of a wing, then the wing has to be in motion in order to create lift. Wings create lift by deflecting air downward and using the equal and opposite reaction that results. Now enter the tail rotor. The tail rotor produces thrust just like an airplane's propeller does. By producing thrust in a sideways direction, this important part counteracts the engine's desire to spin the body of the craft. A rotary motion is the simplest way to keep a wing moving continuously. You can mount two or more wings on a central shaft and spin the shaft, just like the blades on a ceiling fan. The rotating wings of a helicopter function similarly to the airfoils of an airplane wing, although it should be noted that helicopter airfoils are symmetrical, unlike those on a fixed wing aircraft. The helicopter's rotating wing assembly is called the main rotor. If you give the main rotor wings a slight angle of attack on the shaft while they're spinning, the wind begins to develop lift. And just like that, the helicopter has the ability to lift off of the ground and fly away. That's a wrap for this video. What do you guys think about how a helicopter functions? Let us know in the comments below. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. See you in the next one.